Now, I'm not expecting the lights to go out because it's daylight. Uh, but several weeks ago, I was with my, uh, my grandson. And we had, we had a flashlight like this. It was dark. And I was playing around with it. And uh, he wanted to know what that button was for right there. I said, let me tell you, let me tell you something. Here's how you can call out for help. So he watched, and I said, uh, all right, you watch. Says, dot, dot, I turned it off. <laughs> I'm in real trouble, okay. Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Do it over here. Still working, dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 now if I did it right that's Morse code it stands for SOS right that's how you send out the signal well there are times when all of us need to send out a signal for help SOS means help that's that's Morse code I learned that in Boy Scouts. For boaters, if you need help, if any of you have ever had a boat, uh, normally there's a horn that you can blow. When I had a jet ski before it was stolen, not only did I have one of those uh, air horns, but I had an orange flag on a stick. And a couple of times I had to use that. And I learned right quick, you, you better have some way to call help if you have a, a watercraft that's on a lake or a body of water and there's not many other people. I had to use it a couple times to get towed in and I'm glad I had that orange flag and that air horn. For campers or for those who are lost in the woods, you know that the signal for help would be three fires. And if you've got a gun, if you're a hunter and you need help, you fire that gun three times slowly. And then you wait and you do it again you fire the gun three times. Now all of us, we teach our children the easiest way to call for help is to go to a phone and dial what? 911. We teach the kid, that's the first telephone number we teach the children. Now I had a grandson that kind of got a hold of that a little, dialed it and should not have, but anyway. But what's the oldest method of calling for help? We all know it. That's the oldest one. And sometimes we find ourselves in that situation screaming that four-letter word, help. Well, the message today is about a nation that is crying out for help. It's not a, a pandemic or a wildfire that they're afraid of. They are legitimately afraid of an army and an impending uh, war or rampage that will mean the destruction of a people. All through history there have been strong empires and we see we know what strong empires do. They conquer small ones. That's just, it's just the way it is. It's always been that way. And Israel at times found themselves to be that strong empire. They were a great nation, the Bible tells us, under the leadership of King David and under the leadership of King Solomon. But the story today occurs around 700 B.C., 700 years before Jesus was born. And the main character is King Hezekiah. The title of the message goes right along with, with my topic, Help. And you'll find this text is 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 through 20, and then 32 through 34. What's happening in 700 BC? Well, King Hezekiah is the main uh, character of the message. <clears throat> he was the son of a king also. His dad's name was Ahaz. And we know Ahaz as a wicked king in the Bible. It's, it's just a, it's not a crazy thing or a funny ha-ha type thing. But when you read the Old Testament... Sometimes there'll be a good king and there'll be a bad king. There'll be a good king and there'll be a bad king. And usually it's of the same family, the same family members, a good king and a bad king. Well, Ahaz was one of those bad kings. Under his rule, God's people were influenced uh, and indeed forced 
to corrupt the worship practices that God had, had set aside for the people of Israel. King Ahaz had combined the worship in high places. He had set up the golden calves in different places to worship. He had initiated the worship of Baal, which was a foreign god. And according to the Bible, he had also even sacrificed some of his sons to the idol god Moloch. Well, of course, you know that uh, God was displeased in everything that Ahaz had done. And because of this, God's displeasure, he had chosen to punish Ahaz and the people of Israel by use of a foreign country. At this particular time, Assyria has grown to be a great empire. They, they're, they're a mighty, have a mighty army. They have conquered uh, Judah's neighbors. They have conquered the, the lands all around where Ahaz is leading and ruling. So Ahaz is forced to uh, form a truce with Assyria. And the king of Assyria says, okay, we'll leave you alone. We'll just stay out of your way, but you're going to have to pay us some high taxes. And Ahaz agrees. So he, uh, pay, he pays the taxes. In our story today, Hezekiah is the king. He's taken over from his dad Ahaz, and he has rightly redone some of the things that his dad did wrong. Hezekiah has changed the direction of Judah. He has done away with false religions. He's set the idols aside. He has repaired the dilapidated temple of God. He's put the priest back to work. So in other words, God's people again are worshiping and they're being God's people. But there's something else that Hezekiah is going to do that forms, the, that tells us about the danger now and what puts them in danger, and that's this. Hezekiah is going to stop the payments. He's going to stop the taxes. No longer is he going to give Assyria any money. So Hezekiah's non-payment of, non of, of the taxes was recognized by Assyria and the king there as rebellion. So the king of Assyria sends Hezekiah and the people, this is like a public letter, he sends this letter to God's people. We read it in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse number 14. Let's start there. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. Now this letter's from the Assyrian king. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and he spread the letter, he spread it, or the scroll, before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said these words. O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of King Serenitrib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for there were no gods but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, and therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God even thou only. I've showed you how to make an SOS with a, with a flashlight. So out goes the SOS, the call for help from Hezekiah. Aren't you glad that you are not totally aware of every national threat that's reported to the national security staff? I am. So it may be hard to go to sleep at night knowing because we know that our nation has many enemies. We know that Russia is an enemy. We know that Iran hates us and would destroy us if possible. 
We do not, we're not know for sure, but we believe that perhaps China is not our best friend. All of these nations have hacked into our uh, security systems and have gotten through the internet and got into our computers. I just wonder when it's going to be or how long it's going to be till one day I go to the gas pump and not only will my debit or credit card not work, but the whole nation has stopped. I don't know. But there are threats to our nation. People and countries hate America. And there are even some of our own citizens who hate our nation. Well, King Hezekiah has received a threat by the means of communication that was penned by a king that would be the king of Assyria, the enemy of God's people. And that's bad news. Look at verse 14 again. And the Bible says the king received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. Sometimes when we see or hear news or anticipate news, we know it's bad just by the way that it comes to us. For example, our mind tells us sometimes this can't be good. It can't be good when you get a phone call in the middle of the night. It can't be good when you see a police car parked in your driveway. It can't be good when somebody is banging on your door and it's unexpected. The king here in this story is, is in charge. And he has decided that he is going to destroy Hezekiah and the people because they have stopped their payments. And the message in this letter to Hezekiah and the people is this. Pay up or you will suffer the consequences. You know, when threatened, national leaders, some usually sum up or bring up their, their military leaders and say, well, what can we do? Let's get ready for war. But Hezekiah knew there was no way they would have a chance with Assyria. So what does the king do? He does what we ought to do in the very first place. He goes to the Lord in prayer. The king calls upon his God for help. Not just for him, but for his people. Let's look at here at this place of prayer. The Bible tells us that he prayed. It's a good thing that Hezekiah had rebuilt and refurbished the temple of God, was it not? Because that's where he went. The people of God needed a focal point. God provided them a temple. And even when they were in the wilderness with Moses, God provided a tent and provided there an ark, a centerpiece of worship and we know as Christians and the Bible tells us that when Jesus was crucified uh, that particular day the curtain in the temple was rent it was torn and that was the curtain to the Holy of Holies that was telling us that now we don't have to go in to a certain place because God is not just there God is everywhere and the Bible is open the Bible says that Worship of the Lord has been opened up to people. We can worship anywhere. But at this particular time, the temple was important to the people of God and to Hezekiah. And because Hezekiah refurbished the temple and put the priests back to work, there was a place to pray, a place to worship, a place to, place to sacrifice. So Hezekiah went to that place. And unlike some of the ungodly kings of Israel, he knew his place. He went to that temple. But the Holy of Holies was the place where only the high priest would go. But the king had the priest to pray, pray for him. But he prayed to God. And he describes just a little bit about that place where he was praying. At that place was the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant contained the box containing the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses. This was a special place and Hezekiah was there. Now he prayed a special prayer. <clears throat> and I think he prayed in a special way. It's a way, it's a model prayer for us. I know we can tell God anything we want to, any, any way, any how, any language. Because he already knows our hearts, the Bible says. 
<clears throat> but Hezekiah was praying. And as he prayed, he prayed, I think, like this. I've been to some seminars, prayer seminars, where we have been taught a real easy way to pray a, a prayer uh, is by using the, uh, uh, the acrostics, the word ACTS, A-C-T-S, okay? We've got a book named the Book of Acts in, in, in the Bible that tells us about the first church and how, how the church, how God blessed the church. But think about it for, for a moment, those three letters, A-C-T-S. If you pray like that, think about the letter A. So the first thing you're going to do when you pray is you're going to A, you're going to adore the Lord. You're going to adore the Lord. You're going to brag on God's goodness and God's power. And that's what we see Hezekiah doing here. The letter C is after we brag on God, we confess our sins. And we have plenty to confess. After we confess our sins, we thank God that he's forgiven us our sins. And he's blessing us in our lives. And then the letter S stands for supplication. After you have adored the Lord, after you have confessed your sins, after you thank Him for everything you can thank Him of, then you pray for other people. That's a great way to pray. Well, Hezekiah is praying to the Lord, and don't you know that he uses that A and that acrostic to get God's attention? As if he needed to, because God's already knowing what's going on. But Hezekiah starts bragging on God. I don't think of any other any better way to get somebody's attention than to brag on them. Do you? You know, to come to somebody and just tell them how you appreciate them or, hey, you look good today. I, I'm glad to see you, the smile on your face and mean it. I mean, not just, you know, but mean it. Well, that's what Hezekiah's doing. He's telling God how great he is. Uh, for years, I attended the Taylorsville Baptist Camp meeting in Taylorsville, North Carolina. And I'll, I'll never forget there was one particular day. Usually they would have preachers and, and let them preach maybe 20 or 30 minutes at a time, one preacher after another. And it, it, it was great, great sermons. But this particular morning, our job or the assignment was just to stand up and brag on Jesus. And we did that all morning. We bragged on the Lord. Well, that's what Hezekiah is doing. We should do it. It's not only good for God, it's good for us when we brag on the Lord because he's a good God. The Bible gives us several examples of that in scriptures. Exodus 15, 2, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my father's God. I will exalt him. That's what you did when you sang. That's what Penny did when she played and she sang. I believe that. I hope that's what I'm doing now. We're exalting the Lord. First Chronicles 16, 11, Look to the Lord in his strength and seek his face always. Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present ever help in time of trouble. Hezekiah knew these scriptures. He knew to brag on the Lord. He knew God was with him. But you've got to remember his spirit. He's troubled. He's troubled. The army is, at, is, is on the way. He's, he's thinking about himself. He's thinking about his people. He's yelling to God, help. Not just with his words, but with his heart. Help me, God. Well, what was the purpose of the prayer? Well, God was not taken off guard by Hezekiah's display of the scroll. God was watching when king, the king uh, of Assyria penned and wrote that note. God was watching the messenger as the note was delivered. And God was watching Hezekiah as he read the note of warning. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7, the Bible says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God knew the heart of that king. God knew the heart of the king we're talking about this morning, Hezekiah. And then Genesis 6, 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart are on evil continually. And then Proverbs 15, 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God saw it, and God knows. He knew then. He knows what's going on now. He knows all about it. 
And God knew Hezekiah. He knew Hezekiah's request. If God already knows, why bother to pray? Is it not a waste of time? Well, Jesus said this about prayer. He said, when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, and pray to your heavenly Father in secret. It's not a show thing. We don't pray to show off. And your Father who sees in secret will repay you. Verse 7, in praying, do not babble like the pagans who think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Matthew 6, Jesus says, when you pray, I already know it. Then why pray? Well, I think we pray for our benefit more than anything else. And here's one of the reasons. When we pray, and God answers our prayer exactly the way we want it to be answered, exactly the time we want it, we write it down. We remember. And also there are times we pray and we have to wait and wait. I've had church members who prayed for salvation of their family members and prayed for them for years and when they're saved, what do they do? They say, I've been praying. They write it down. Some of them know how long they've been praying. They note their request, then they note their answer. And then there are times when we pray and we don't get the answer that we would like or we're not sure that how God is, is dealing. Prayer is for us as well. It's good to pray. It's good for us to pray. Well, the purpose of Hezekiah's prayer, we all know what it was. Help! Help. Lord, look and hear what the king says about you. Now, he's pointing his finger to the enemy. Without saying it, Hezekiah was really wanting God to, to take notice, really take notice of the Assyrians. That great army was camped nearby. And records had shown that on their way to Hezekiah and the people, they had destroyed and ransacked as many as 46 towns. Everybody in their path comes to ruin in this, with this Assyrian army. But what was the insult? What was the insult to God by the Assyrians? In verse 17 and 18, Hezekiah notes that the Assyrians destroy the false worship. There'll be times in the Bible where you see God would destroy that, but it's the Assyrians. It's the enemies of God's people who are destroying the false worship and tearing down the idols in every town that they capture. But why are they doing this? They are not doing this for the glory of God. Everybody knows that in every town there were idols and idols were believed or were worshipped and believed to protect the people. What the Assyrian army did was when they would go through a town, they would destroy the idols. They would harm the people, hurt the people, destroy the people, kill the people. But what they were saying was this. They were saying, no gods can save you. They were saying, we're God. That's what the Assyrians were saying. We are God. And Hezekiah brought this to the Lord. God, do you see what they're saying and what they're doing? They're putting you down, Lord. If you go back to chapter 18, verse number 29, we see this. The Bible says, thus saith the king, this is Sarit, uh, the king of Assyria writing, and he's writing, remember he wrote to the king, but he also wrote so the other people, so the people could see this too. And here's what he's saying. The Assyrian king says, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. 
Neither let Hezekiah, your king, make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of the Syrians. Verse 35 of chapter 18 says, Who are they among all the gods of the country that they have delivered their country out of mine hand, says that Assyrian king, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. See, he's insulting God. The king of Assyria is saying, I'm God. I'm God. We're in charge. All through the Bible, the Bible, all through the Bible, God says, trust in the Lord. But King Serenitrib says, don't trust in the Lord. Is that not the attitude of the devil? Is that not the spirit of the devil? Trust in the Lord. But somebody else out there says, don't trust in the Lord. So Hezekiah's plea was, now, Lord, our God, please save us. Help, help us. Well, let's go back to the text here in 2 Kings 19, 20. And we're going to see the result of the prayer. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Serenacrib, king of Israel, I have heard. Notice there. Who shows up in verse number 20? God's man and God's prophet. Isaiah shows up. That tells me that not only do we not get immediate results sometimes in our prayers, but sometimes we need people to assure us. Even when what we pray is going to happen, we need assurance. And that's what Isaiah does. He's there right on time. If you've made a request of God for a show of mercy and love and grace or power, sometimes God uses somebody else to assure you that God has heard. He uses the prophet of God. Today he still uses the man of God. Today he uses church leaders and church members. He uses us. To assure people that God's listening when we maybe doubt it. And then 2 Kings 19.32, here's what was promised to happen. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it, by the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and my servant David's sake. Well, King Serenitrib of Assyria planned to attack Jerusalem. Just like he went through all those other villages he was ready. The army was ready, and he had a plan. And here's what he was going to do. <clears throat> it, part of it is what I've just read to you. Here's what the plan was. It's what they did back in that day. The archers would begin to hail arrows to where the arrows would be flying everywhere, and people would go inside. Nobody would be safe. As those arrows went over the wall, wooden shields would be placed over the soldiers just in case somebody wanted to throw a rock or maybe shoot an arrow back. And underneath those wooden shields, workers would carry buckets of dirt. And they would carry bucket after bucket after bucket to the wall until a ramp had been built. And the entire army could ramp its way over the wall and lay siege to the city. None of that was going to happen, God said, because God promised the battle, the battle would be different. It would not be the way the Assyrians had planned. And get this in verse 35. There was not even a battle. There wasn't even a battle. Verse 35, and it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. The Assyrians went to sleep with vision.